Super excited here today to welcome a guest that I've never had on the Functional Forum Evolution of Medicine podcast. I've sort of seen from afar and uh, we're going to be having a really exciting and interesting conversation about the state of the world, uh, microbes, community and all those kind of things. And Doc, just to give you, uh, I guess, a bit of context, I, I have to admit, like I kind of misjudged you, I have to say. So when I first uh, met you, I, I see a lot of functional medicine doctors out there doing all types of things. First time I came across you, I was like, oh, he's a supplement guy. He's good at selling his supplement. And I was like, okay, that's that guy. And part of, you know, and that was that. Then it was like, oh, wait, hang on. He's into regenerative agriculture. That's interesting. Like, he's this guy. And then it was like, oh, he's into hugging too. And I'm like, okay, and maybe <laughs> I do like this guy. And then, um, you know, I saw you on the, the Rich Roll podcast. And I was like, man, this is like a Charles Eisenstein level thinker, right? Someone who is like pushing the boundaries of our conversation. And um, so I, I guess I just want to admit that as a starting point that um, I, I kind of had you uh, mispegged at the beginning and I really appreciate, you know, the, all the work that's been done up until now. And, and I know that you're only just getting started. Uh, just to give you some context for anyone who's listening behind, you know, at home who hasn't heard of uh, Dr. Zach Bush. And I love this, what you say on your website, applying the rigor of science the strength of humanity and the intelligence of nature to transform our world. And I feel, you know, a hundred percent alignment with that. So, you know, it's community week here at uh, the rogue health economist. And so I love this quote it says our gut microbiome is a direct extension of the nature that we touch. And I guess I want to, I want to start there. I mean, we're, we're living in a world where everyone's hypersensitive to viruses and where they are and how they're getting into us share with our, our audience here like what we need to know about what viruses are where they are how many there are and how humans and, and viruses interact yeah it's, it's such a fascinating moment on on the planet right now because never has the microbiome gotten so much attention so for me i'm excited that the world is starting to pay attention to what i think is the most important journey that we will take as a species which is to come to understand that we are not alone, and if we, if we choose to be alone, we will die quickly, and we're right in the midst of that. We are dying faster, younger, every day now, and our children in the United States are now screening at about 52% with a chronic disorder or disease by the time they're 17. Uh, this is compared to 1.2% of our children in the 1960s with a chronic disorder or disease, and so we have so poisoned the planet. We have so isolated ourselves from the nature we were, we were developed within uh, that we are now dying and, and experiencing extraordinary levels of chronic disease and disorder that are really threatening the survival of our species. And as we look at human fertility with a drop of 52% of it in our sperm count just over the last 40 years, in all Western nations that has occurred. Uh, and we are now at one in three males with sperm counts in the infertile range um, at all ages. And so it's an extraordinary journey into you know, if we extrapolate that another 30 years, we're going to see, you know, more than 60% of the population with, with an infertility state. And then another 30 years, you're at 85%. And you start to see the end of our species within the next 100 years. Some of people thinking as soon as 60 to 70 years. And so I was really preaching that message that we have to reconnect to our microbiome. Uh, every disease now, from cancer to heart disease to autoimmune diseases, are all now mapping genetically back to the loss of some microbe in the gut. And so we're having to come to terms with the fact that when the soil is disturbed at the gut level, we start to fail in our biology, which is exactly what you see in your backyard garden or in a, a chemical farm. When the nutrients fail to be delivered by a microbial you know, source, you start to get a weakened immune system. You start to get a weakened life force within that plant and they become prone to invasive weeds so you have you pour on the herbicides invasive pests that so you pour on the pesticides and you're palliating a sick and and you know diminished state of life within that crop and that i believe is what we're seeing with our children today we have a sick and diminished vitality in our children and we see childhood cancers are skyrocketing we see everything from leukemias all the way to brain tumors uh, in children under the age of 12 now uh, we see sarcomas in children that, you know, that sarcomas when I was in medical school in the 90s was a disease of 80 year olds. And now suddenly it's 15 years later, they're happening in six year olds. I've had children die in my clinic, nine year olds with metastatic sarcomas. This has never been seen before. And so we have so accelerated the aging process. We have so accelerated that that's the crisis point. But the opportunity is extraordinary. The opportunity we have right now 
It will be the biggest scientific awakening, the biggest transformation, paradigm shifting mindset that we've had in 2000 years. The only time that I can find in history where we have changed the significance that we will in the next decade or two in science is when we discovered the earth was round. That shift in Greek science with Pythagoras and other great you know, observers of nature realized we didn't have a flat planet. And they started to see clear scientific proof that we were a round planet. And then eventually we would find out that that round planet wasn't the center of the universe spinning around us, we were spinning around everything else. And so this is a, what we're about to go. We're gonna go into a three-dimensional state of understanding instead of a two-dimensional state of understanding of human health. And you guys chose to be physicians right now. It is so exciting. You are so blessed to be a doctor and scientist right now because in 2000 years, nobody's had the opportunity to participate in a paradigm shift like this. Every day in our laboratories, I get goosebumps of what we are seeing because it's never been believed before. We are seeing things happen because for the first time we're taking microbial intelligence and putting it in touch with the human systems in a Petri dish. For all of scientific history, we've been sterilizing that Petri dish to make sure that it's only the human cell in there. And then we study cardiovascular disease, cancer and all this. And we say we understand the disease, but we only understood it as an isolated system. We never came to realize that maybe mother nature could be part of that picture. And when we add back mother nature to that Petri dish of cancer cells, the cancer simply apoptosis. It goes into program cell suicide. And three days later, you've, you've seen a cleaning up of the system. The healthy cells, when they see the intelligence of nature, reduce their stress at the mitochondria level immediately, which is fascinating to me. The mitochondria is the microbiome within us, right? And so you've got this extraordinary system that you mentioned, you asked for, for the scale of, of the biology around us. Let's start at the bacteria first, because it, it's in and of itself grandiose, but we're around 30,000 species, maybe 40,000 species is probably the ideal microbiome of the human. The typical American is around eight to 10,000 species. Uh, some of them as low as 4,000 species. So we've had this collapse of maybe down to 10 or 15% of our original microbiome. We know that by the American Gut Project that is studying the, the Hadza tribe in Africa and their extraordinary hunter-gatherer lifestyle is still supporting this vast ecosystem. And that quote that you took uh, early on from me was the result of that, that experience with Jeff Leach uh, in Africa, realizing that the gut microbiome was an extension of the greater space around the tribe. And so the tribe was expressing in their gut flora the bacteria that could only be found on zebra hides. And so they were so in touch with their food that you know they they go out for three days, find a herd of zebra, shoot them with their their bows will quarter them and carry a quartered zebra on their shoulder for three days back to the to the tribe over that time their skin and body is infused with the flora of zebra and then they eat the zebra meat and there is no inflammation there's no downside it's consequence and i'm fascinated by the possibility that the microbial life of the hide of the zebra might prepare a consumer whether it be a lion that's tearing apart that zebra or a human is it possible that the microbiome of that would actually inform, intelligently inform the gut of the, the carnivore behind it that would then be able to digest that without an inflammatory reaction? Now imagine the American consumer who's never seen a cow, which is actually true. We, you know, this is happening. We brought a journalist with us to one of these farms uh, with Nicole Ragland, our filmmaker uh, for our nonprofit. And uh, they were approaching a farm in, in Pennsylvania. He was from New York City. They're approaching, he suddenly grabbed her arm and said, is that a cow? You know, he, she's like, yes, that's a cow. You, <laughs> you can't tell me you've never seen a cow. He had never seen a cow as a 32 year old journalist. And so this is how divorced we are from our food system. And so how is that guy eating a hamburger ever gonna have the intelligence of nature baked into that experience? And so I really believe that what we touch is the microbi microbial intelligence. And so as we get divorced from the greater ecosystems, our food system being an obvious one, but also the air we breathe, massive amount of intake through the breath of the microbes around us. So the bacteria, maybe 30, 40,000 species. But then you get to the fungi. Uh, well, I guess first you've got the parasites. Parasites, 300,000 species. Then you've got fungi at 5 million species. And then you've got the viruses. And there we can't keep putting the viruses in the microbiome. They're not living creatures. Uh, if you read you know, like Wikipedia on, on, on microbiome, it defines it as, as bacteria, parasites, fungi, and viruses. 
with the note that viruses aren't living beings, but because they're so small, we go ahead and ca categorize them as microbiome. Well, the first word, micro, I could see justifying that. The second word, biome, means living sphere, is not going to fit the word virus in it. We have to, as physicians, come to terms with the fact that viruses are not living creatures. They cannot reproduce. They cannot produce energy. They, they, all they are are packages of genetic information for adaptation uh, of, of the species around. And so we exude viral information in the form of exosomes uh, in microRNA probably by most volume, but also macroRNA and DNA strands are exuded from the human body. And uh, the chief scientist in my lab, John Gilday, PhD in genomics from Johns Hopkins, uh, he has, was the very first publication showing that you could take human exosomes and put them in another biologic system and that genetic information would be absorbed just like a virus would be expected to be able to achieve it. So the exosome is behaving just like a virus. And so we need to stop thinking that viruses are a part of the microbiome, something that's there as this foreign entity. It is literally the genomic you know, adaptation language. It is the language and communication network of the genome between the species. And so we see viruses move around the planet at a volume that boggles the mind. In the air we breathe, 10 to the 31 viruses. In the soil beneath our feet, 10 to the 30 viruses. In the ocean water, 10 to the 31 viruses. And so you start to add that up, 10 to the 30, by the way, is 10 million times more than stars are the entire universe. Okay, these are yeah. numbers that you just can't find in nature. They're so big. And now suddenly the CDC or the NIH comes along and says there's six of these viruses that we need to be scared of. Six out of 10 to the what? 31 times three. And so you've got an impossible reality that we currently believe in. It is impossible that the virome is against us. It is impossible that the microbiome is against us. And so after 150 years of believing in the germ theory and believing in, in our necessity for sterilization, we need to rework that understanding. The only reason that we really you know, came up with that was because we realized that surgeons, if they touched you know, gangrenous limbs and then did surgery on another patient, you know, put Civil War times here, they could, they could create gangrene in that limb or increase the risk of gangrene. That's how we decided that there was germ theory, really. You know, that was the proof in the pudding for Pasteur and his, his colleagues in the late 1800s. That is a true statement. If you take a, a large bacterial population and plant them in another healthy tissue where they can thrive, and you've, you've overwhelmed you know, the, the garden of, of microbial diversity with a, a single species, you're going to create a problem. But we need to rethink it in every other term. Outside of the operating room, you can't, you can't apply that information. Uh, certainly, the viruses are the most you know, extreme version of, of a twisting of the truth here. We have made an assumption that viruses are part of the microbiome. That was a mistake. We then made the assumption that germ theory applied to viruses. But if you go back to Koch's postulates, which are really those fundamental truths about what institutes the proof of an infection, you need to see signs of inflammation, right? And so you need to see fever. You need to see an elevated white blood cell count. You need to see all these things. If we just look at COVID alone, this extraordinary study that um, you know, I've been talking about all over the place, 5,700 patients admitted to, to New York hospitals with COVID-19, and it has their presenting symptoms, their, their, uh, all of their uh, essential data coming in uh, in the emergency room, including laboratories and their vital signs, and you see that the entire population has an average body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, which is normal body temperature. Mm -hmm. So 5,700 patients presenting what we're calling a viral infection, and they are afebrile. They also happen to have absolutely no elevation of white blood cells. The average was like 5,000. And so you're on the low end of normal for you know, uh, that initial presentation with no elevation in lymphocytes or neutrophils either. Lymphocytes is what you would expect. Then you look at other markers of inflammation and they're not there. There's no increase in ALK-FOS. There's no increase in triglycerides. There's no increase in, in uh, the vascular inflammation. And so there's no signs of an inflammatory reaction going on. They're presenting with a liver injury from hypoxia. And so it doesn't even look anything like, you know, something that we would call an infection. It looks like cyanide poisoning. It looks like a, a change to the, the hemoglobin shape and therefore a loss of oxygen carrying delivery capacity. And then we go treat it with a respirator as if it's respiratory failure. It's not. It's, it's the inability to carry oxygen. It doesn't matter if you breathe 40% oxygen on a respirator. You, it doesn't change hemoglobin binding. And so you, you, we are killing patients on respirators, which 88% of mortality in New York City if you end up on a respirator. 
compared to a mortality that looks to be less than 0.1% if you're not in the hospital. So we're doing something radically wrong between hospital door and ICU. We're doing something that is fundamentally against the physiology uh, that we are seeing out in the public. And we need to stop thinking that this is an infection. We need to start thinking this is a change in the terrain of the human body, including a change of the red blood cell in a very small number of patients. The vast majority, again, don't get hypoxia, very, you know, might get mild fever eventually, some cough, clear that. But what we know is that you know, in, in the course of action, it's hypoxia without fever or white blood cell count. And then if you keep them in the ICU for a few days, their lungs start to fill with fluid, which is exactly what happens with a drowning patient or somebody with severe altitude injury. If you create hypoxia at the lung, it will eventually get that ground glass appearance on CT scan, which is fluid leaking out, it's you know plasma uh, into the lung space, and then you'll develop a few days later, pneumonia as bacteria set up shop in the liquid within the lung. So they're dying of secondary pneumonias downstream of a hypoxic event upstream. The word infection and virus should not be put together. It's only in the collapse of biology downstream from a hypoxic injury do we have, have Koch's postulate start to happen. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, you know, just as we started the functional forum six years ago, you know, the microbiome uh, research had come out a couple of years before. And, you know, it's almost like I was like, this is going to change the world, right? This is going to change the practice of medicine. And yet here we are, you know, they say it takes 17 years for the practice of medicine to change from new science to, to care. Well, we're in that stage right now where nothing really changed. Like a few functional medicine doctors thinking differently and a few people you know, working on the terrain and, 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 and focusing on that. I guess I would love to, you know, one of the things that you, you shared and uh, that I've heard you talk about with regard to specifically COVID was this idea of um, unmasking toxicity. And I'd love for you to go into that a little bit because obviously we've spoken a lot about toxicity. We've had a ton of content on, you know, the toxic levels of glyphosate and all these kind of things. Obviously, the functional medicine doctor is well trained to understand the signs and symptoms of toxicity. Uh, but it seems like there's some connection here between viruses and, and toxicity that we need to that we need to look at a little bit deeper. Yeah, so the first study came out of China and of course got no press uh, because it was a brilliant study looking at uh, air pollution and COVID related death. And um, that study was then followed up by a Harvard study that got all the press, of course. Um, I actually pr prefer some of the science in the Chinese paper. I think it was done really well. Um, but nonetheless, they both agreed that the, the highest risk factor so far for death from COVID has nothing to do with the virus. It has to do with the particulate matter uh, that you're breathing uh, in the form of air pollution. And so um, there's uh, a category of air pollution that's designated as PM 2.5. Uh, and PM 2.5 is a particulate matter less than 2.5 microns in diameter. And it's measured by micrograms per cubic meter. And every micron increase in a cubic meter of air, every micron increase in that 2.5 PM was a 20-fold increased risk of death for, for COVID-related uh, disease. And so uh, the viral infection itself doesn't even, you know, raise to that, you know, near that level of death. And so every micron increase. And then you look at Hubei province and you realize they have the most toxic air on the planet. They are often in the 400 parts per, per or microns per cubic meter of air pollution, where New York City is typically in the 40 to 80 range. So you're somewhere, you know, tenfold, you know, to, to 20 fold that of New York City in Hubei province. And that's where we saw the highest death toll per capita. New York City, number two behind that, is the highest levels of, of PM in, in, from a, a municipal standpoint. But it turns out that PM 2.5 is very high in agricultural spaces. And many of my lectures have covered the issue of Roundup and glyphosate, the death of the soils. When you spray Roundup and glyphosate, kill the microbiome of the soils, you create dead soil and you create silting effect. And that goes into the river systems and all that, but also goes in the air. We have the biggest dust bowl in history happening today. We're losing two tons of topsoil per acre of land in the United States every year now. And so that is ending up in the air. And so lots of deaths up in Idaho, lots of deaths down in Louisiana. Those are the river systems that are collecting the Roundup and the highest silt rates in the country. And so whether your particulate matter is from transportation and energy in New York City or downstream in, in Louisiana at the end of the Mississippi River that collects 85% of this uh, agricultural waste and, and runoff, in, in Louisiana, you can find 75% of the air and 75% of the rainfall contaminated with Roundup and, and particulate matter. 
So what do we know about PM 2.5 and viruses? We know that influenza and COVID are both capable of binding to PM, PM 2.5 and creating conglomerates of viruses. Now you've changed the terrain. Now a virus that's supposed to enter the human system and create a biologic update, a genomic update to our genome, we are more than 50% of our human genes are, are inserted by viruses. More than 10% of our entire human genome was inserted by retroviruses like HIV. And so we need the genetic updates. That's how we were formed as a mammalian you know, you know, kingdom was through constant viral updates, constant you know, adaptive changes over a billion years. And then we see the opportunity for mam mammals to, to uh, come to be. Oh, awesome. I've got my little uh, gecko come back. I've had this gecko hanging out with me for two days. He's like one inch long. He's the cutest thing in the world. I'm sorry to be distracted, but he just makes me so happy. Oh, little buddy. It's not a gecko um, commercial. This is an actual gecko. Yeah, it's an actual <laughs> little gecko that lives in the house here. Um, and so... Um, <laughs> oh Let me God. ask you about New York because, you know, I know from just the geography and, and a history lesson. There he is. <laughs> See the little guy on there. Oh, that's... Wow, in the house. <laughs> that, that's a little biology lesson right there. That's, that's microdiversity happening right around us so, here. So. Isn't anyway, my understanding sorry for that. that the, the Great Lakes, you know, through the old system, they end up coming into the Hudson, right? And end up coming through New York. So is that another piece of the New York puzzle? That's right. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that toxicity of that river system goes back to the late 1800s. So our highest cancer rates were always in the Northeast until... 1997 uh, hit and suddenly we flipped the map and the most toxic space became Louisiana, Mississippi and the whole deep south there as we, we put Roundup into all of our crops. In 1996 that happened with GMO crops. And so uh, we've seen the toxification of these systems and we see an increase in, in death of all sorts, respiratory on down to cancer. And so uh, now I'm, you know, doing a three hour film on this. So it takes a long time to get through all the science here, but you know, the, 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 the caveat is when you have PM 2.5, you bind viruses. It, the virus is now supposed to enter the human genome through the ACE2 receptor, which is expressed heavily in our lungs. Um, it's actually you know, in a balanced state. So ACE2 receptors at a normal physiologic expression, we've proved in the, in the population doesn't cause harm. We now know that you know, tens of thousands of people in Santa Clara County were exposed. They did a nice universal screening in Stanford last past two weeks. And they found that 0.1% of the population uh, became ill. And so uh, you've got this, or, or died, uh, fatality rate there in Santa Clara is 0.1%. And only 2.5% or something like that uh, were exposed and became ill. And so you've got this you know, huge expression. So for all the rest of the population that gets exposed, never even manifested you know, anything of a downstream inflammatory reaction or from bacterial shift or anything else, because the receptors in the lung for that virus distribute it appropriately into our genomic experience. Nobody has not seen this virus. The virus is ubiquitous, right? And so it's not like it hits one person and then you got lucky and you avoided it because you were wearing a mask. It's literally in the air. The respiratory droplet science is only a very small part of how, how viruses spread. That goes three feet, dies in three days. All that science they're telling you is only respiratory droplet significant. The aerosolized viruses go into the stratosphere and, and they travel around the planet. And so that's how you know, influenza travels in such a predictable pattern every single year is because the virus in its production from the, the mammalian system and, and humans produce the vast majority of that H1N1 every year, we put it up into the stratosphere and then through aerosolized virus and then it travels the world. And you know, I've got a nice study from Spain that shows that you can measure the same virus in ice caps where there's no human activity as you can in deserts as, as well as municipal cities. And so it's not like humans are the only trafficking for viruses. Nature didn't wait for humans to show up 200,000 years ago to be able to put viruses into the ecosystem. It needed a distribution system that was not reliant on you know, mammals and, and their movement. Uh, there's a lot of people, you know, if you watch you know, the CDC stuff, they say it's all because of airplane travel. Well, that's impossible that nature was waiting for the invention of the airplane to need genetic, uh, a genomic information stream. Um, and so, you know, we just have this very humanistic, you know, narcissistic viewpoint of viruses. We think it's a human experience. It's not at all. It is a global pathway to genomic uh, variability. The genes that we get from our viruses are super important, and I need to get into that later maybe, but 
first we need to get back to the air pollution piece. So now picture a situation where you have very high PM 2.5 and now you've got lots of viruses clumping on. So instead of one virus per, you know, uh, part per, per billion in air, you might have 10,000 times concentration of that because of the, the particulate matter in the air. So now you have a high concentration hitting those ACE2 re receptors in the lung. Now who's dying from this? It is actually not lung patients. It's cardiovascular patients, diabetics, and kidney patients. What do those three patient people have in common with their IL-2 receptors? What they have in common is two drugs. All three of those conditions demand, if you are going to meet standards of care and you can get sued for not pay putting patients on these two drugs, is a statin drug and an ACE inhibitor. If not an ACE inhibitor because they get a cough, did I just tell you that? The number one side effect of an ACE inhibitor is cough. Why? Because of an upregulation of ACE2 receptors. And so ARB is the next one, and ARB has a different expression of the ACE2 inhibitor. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs and statins all upregulate the IL-2 or the ACE2 receptor in the lung. Now you have high parts per million 2.5 with an upregulated ACE2. Now the biologic experience is completely abnormal, and you end up with way too, genet too much genetic expression in a small space. And now we are generating tons of this virus abnormally. And so we're now exuding this genomic information throughout the body and throughout our, our general environment abnormally. Even then, uh, you know, in that state, if we would then address that, the downstream hypoxic effect, why is the patient getting hypoxic? It's because if you get a high PM 2.5, binding to that PM 2.5 is cyanide, which is a very common con constituent of air pollution. So now you have cyanide zipping in on PM 2.5 being carried by the virus. The virus is just doing what it's supposed to do is genetically update the cell. It had a Trojan horse on the back of it that was the air pollution with cyanide. And so with ACE2 uh, receptors upregulated from a statin and an ACE inhibitor, you are now creating an entryway for cyanide and a hypoxic injury to the body. Instead, we keep saying this is an infection and it's a terrible virus, so it's keeping us from thinking outside the box and actually looking at our patients and saying, why are they afebrile and hypoxic and dying of liver failure? If, if we didn't believe in the virus story and took a step back, we could, get, we could have gotten to this solution much sooner because in 2002, in SARS, they presented the same way. We have seen this 18 years ago. Blue patients that have to wait three days before their lungs fill with fluid and then they get pneumonia and die. That was the pattern that was expressed back in 2002 and we were told it was such a bad virus that it never made us ask the deeper questions of viruses aren't even alive. How is the virus killing a patient? They don't even have an infection. They don't have you know, any of the signs of Koch's postures, but we are told through this fear paradigm that there is an infection. And so by our miscategorization of viruses into the microbiome, we have come to apply you know, gangrenous science to this beautiful genomic sequence of communication across the planet, and we are acting incorrectly. We have the incorrect paradigm scientifically that is now even further blinded to us through the emotion of fear. And so now we have physicians who won't even go into the ICUs to treat patients with COVID when we know that the death rate is no different, in fact, much lower than 2017 flu was or 2013 flu. You know, we have flu all the time, you know, on a routine basis every decade or two, that is way worse than this COVID death rate has been. And yet we're treating these patients like they have Ebola. You know, nobody's going in the room, nobody will touch them. We're in like triple lockdown air control. It's the fear that has so perverted our scientific perspective here that we are killing these patients, literally. Why are we killing the patients? First of all, we're putting them on respirators. Once IL-2 or ACE2 inceptors are increased, then IL-2 and all your interleukins are going to increase because oxygen at high concentration is extremely oxidative date of injury. And if you have hemoglobin that can't carry the oxygen anyways, you're not fixing the problem. You need to treat the patient you know, with something that's going to change the shape of the hemoglobin is my belief. And I really am eager for somebody who's in the hospital right now to hear this and do this. Just treat with a cyanide kit. If that patient is blue and hypoxic, don't put them on the respirator. Treat them as a cyanide poisoning. Give them the, the th quick, quick three injections of sodium nitrate and the other two. And, you, and you're going to see the change to meth hemoglobin. And they're suddenly going to be able to carry oxygen again. You could heal them in three or four minutes if that's right. And so please think away from the virus and start to think about the, the PM 2.5 that was the Trojan horse with the cyanide on the back of that virus that's causing the injury to the hemoglobin. The virus is an innocent bystander. I guarantee that's the case. The science is really stacked against any evidence that this virus is causing an inflammatory reaction. 
5,700 patients presenting New York City hospitals, they were not a, they were not febrile. They did not have an elevated white count. They didn't have a suppressed white count that you can also see. They had stone cold normal labs with the exception of you know, ele elevated transaminases in the liver and hypoxemia. And so they have a hypoxic lung and liver injury that they're walking in with and you're treating them like they have an infection. They're, you're treating them like they have respiratory failure. So we've got to change this paradigm because people are dying. Tens of people, tens of thousands of people are dying because we have the wrong model, because we have a fear paradigm around a virus as if it was a living being, as if it was a microbe, as if it was an infection. It is a genomic update. So what role for like our community, because like I know one of the things you share, like we're, we're in a super centralized structure, right? Where everyone goes to this hospital or otherwise. And if you look across primary care right now, if you look across, you know, functional medicine, like there's quite a lot of clinics that are closed because of, you know, the, the different state rules. But it seems as though with what you're saying, you know, that one, a decentralized strategy where people could go into a lot of places where there aren't a lot of other people and also to be able to execute these kind of protocols, um, you know, that, that we need, I guess, more of a, a sort of a decentralized approach or, you know, that could happen at primary care, could happen in urgent care. What are your, what are your thoughts about um, sort of like of, of showing one that you're right and two then, you know, and then ramping it up? It's easy. I mean, this is already an FDA approved treatment right on the market as a cyanide kit. Like we don't need any clinical trials. You, you could prove this in five minutes. And so I could do it in my clinic. You can, you know, we give cyanide kits to people who work in the chemical industry. My, one of my uh, operators uh, worked for, for the chemical industry for 30 years and she always had to carry around a cyanide kit. You self-administer this thing uh, just like you would an EpiPen. And so this is something we could literally just put in the hands of, of not even healthcare workers. We could put this in the hands of, you know, nutritionists and, you know, whoever's out there, RNs, whatever, and, and have them treating people in the community. And they would never have to go into the hospital to be exposed to all the, you know, the pathogens that we've developed with multi-drug resistance and everything else. They, they would never get pneumonia downstream if we just treated it as an outpatient. If the hospitals really were afraid of being overloaded, which they didn't actually get overloaded, I know that there was nurses and doctors that were exhausted and worked into oblivion because of the whole fear paradigm and all of the levels of you know intense thing and and an and inappropriate intensity of icu care instead of treating the hypoxia they were being told to put them on respirators which is obviously a very intensive uh standpoint from effort and and infrastructure and personnel so i'm not debating whether physicians and, and nurses have been ground into the the floor here they have and the reason is because we have the wrong paradigm but interesting, the hospitals didn't get overloaded. China, with the U.S.'s WHO and everybody else's initial numbers being so inflated and so wrong, thought that they were going to have a massive crisis. So China built 16 hospitals in Hubei province in six weeks. They finished their first two hospitals in six days. They built 1,000-bed hospitals in six days from the ground up. It's amazing. If you haven't seen these videos of how they did this, there's, there's like 120 earth moving machines that are working in simultaneous thing 24 7 so they actually go in and excavate the site lay foundation pour concrete build a thousand bed hospital in six days and it's open for patient care the u.s couldn't even get masks on our patient uh, patients and, and care providers we are not prepared we don't have the ingenuity of scale to deal with a real crisis we didn't see a real crisis this time we had less respiratory death in the united states by cdc's own numbers than we did in any previous flu season in the last four years. And so we have to come to terms with the fact that we are not prepared for crisis. We didn't even handle this pseudo crisis well. We, are, we don't have the supply chain figured out because we outsourced it all to China. If we really believe that, that health autonomy is important, then we need to redesign our healthcare system completely. And it needs to begin at the understanding of nature's role in health. And if we change the food within a hospital, less people would die. If we change the air in hospitals such that they were breathing a diverse microbiome in a day, fewer people would die. If we change the way in which nurses and doctors got to interact with nature throughout their day, fewer of them would be depressed, burned out, and exhausted and hopeless. And so we need to fundamentally change everything that we've designed in healthcare because at every level we have decided we are against nature. So we purify our air. We, you know, it's all with the mentality that we are separate from, devoid of, and we need to battle against nature. That's why we're dying in such droves. 
And so we need to prepare with a new mindset. We need to go to a three-dimensional belief, not a, not a flat earth belief here of human health. We need to go to a three-dimensional model. An understanding of human health is a biologic system of the planet itself and its microbiome and its nutrients and its air and its water systems and everything else is part of your health. And that will help us to redesign cities. It will help us redesign hospitals for sure. It will certainly help redesign clinics. So um, I'm very excited to, to get nature back in the definition of health. Absolutely. I really uh, share your vision for that. And actually, if you're watching this and you haven't seen the video that we did when we went through the Fielder Clinic in Stuttgart, which is a Rudolf Steiner hospital, you basically just described what it was. I mean, the yeah. way that they cleaned, the way that they organized, the way that the rooms were set up, how there was a garden and, 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 and air came into the hospitals. It was absolutely incredible to see. There's a five minute video that I'll share with everyone um, on, on the YouTube channel. But I guess, uh, um, so are you sort of feeling at this moment that this shift or this moment of COVID-19 is a moment that it is now possible to facilitate this transformation of, of consciousness inside, inside healthcare where there wasn't really like a need to do it three months ago? Well, the, the need was there 30 years ago. We just didn't do it. We didn't have the, the, the knowledge base. We didn't have the, the, you know, the, the science to prove this new paradigm. And I'm conscious that you know, it, it took over 100 years before science even started to embrace a, 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 the concept of around Earth. And now 2,000 years later, we still have the Flat Earth Society. There's still a significant portion of, of population, and apparently the number is going up rapidly in the last 10 years of people who believe the Earth is flat. And so I'm not under any delusion that people are going to still think viruses are infecting people in 10 years. Like, it's going to take us a very di rigorous effort to overturn the last 120 years of belief and the last couple thousand years of belief that humans are separate from nature. You know? And so this is going to take time. I think people are going to die because of that lag of, of shift. And I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for the physicians and nurses that will be burned out and overworked in the old paradigm. But as we go into a three-dimensional model of human health, there's going to be huge resistance because we have a three and a half trillion dollar flat system. And it's going to be very resistant to, to you know, taking apart, dismantling its two-dimensional dominance to allow for the three-dimensional structure to emerge. And so that's going to be very frustratingly slow on some levels, but it could happen literally tomorrow in every one of our clinics. Is if we need to lose the the fear paradigm, and I, I really think functional medicine has fallen into a trap. I really, you know, I've shown up at a lot of functional medicine you know, events with kind of an unpopular view that we kicked the allopathic mindset, you know, off the stool and then put the stool right back up and sat on it again with a slightly different toolbox, but we didn't change our mentality. We said, don't give it a box, give silver, you know, give, give, you know, all these other things, give garlic, you know, kill the microbes this way. You're still in the, in the mindset that microbes need to be killed. The amount of, you know, Lyme clinics that are out there devastating their patients with antibiotics and natural antimicrobials is, is a very big problem that functional medicine is really orchestrating. We need to lose the concept of infection. Lyme is exactly like the viruses, never been shown to increase inflammation. If you do electron microscopy of people with spirochetes in their tissue, you will see one spirochete gently moving between human cells with no signs of inflammation or damage behind it. It looks like a cow grazing on a hillside. And that's what it is. It's a chemoheterotroph that can clean up sulfur compounds that we can't get out of our system. We changed the terrain. We poisoned the human body with sulfur compounds. And suddenly a rare condition called Lyme, which was an overexpression of, of a spirochete, suddenly went from a small pocket in the Northeast to, if you look at rickettsial disease today, it's all in the, in the Mississippi, Louisiana Roundup belt where we just have poisoned the bodies with sulfur. And so if we poison through herbicides and pesticides, the spirochete is going to have to come in to help clean up the damage. And then we blame the spirochete and we try to kill it and the person gets worse. And we're like, well, maybe it's a co-infection. Maybe you have Babesia or something else. And then we kill the Babesia and they get worse. And then we say, oh, you know what? We just found 13 retroviruses in the bloodstream of, of ticks. And so that must be the retroviruses. And so we should kill the viruses. Do you see what we've done? We've, we've decided that every level of the microbiology from fungi to yeast to bacteria to yeast, the viruses are the problem when in fact it's the change in poisoning of the terrain, the loss of, loss of microbial diversity that's necessitating the microbial shifts. 
And then we see that and we, we call that the disease. No, it's just a marker of collapse. The, the presence of a virus overexpressed is the marker of an abnormal ACE2 receptor system that's supposed to be bringing that genetic information into your body. It's also got Trojan horse on the back of it. You know, so we keep acting like germ theory has proved everything when in fact germs and the microbial shift that we would see in disease are in fact the microbiome's effort to do damage control in a damaged space. In, in the agricultural you know, parallel here, we can look at weeds. Weeds are the same phenomenon. And if you go and clear cut and through rototilling or over plowing a field, the first things that show up are the weeds. It's exactly what happens in a hospital. You, antibiotics, antibiotics, the weeds pop up. MRSA, VRE, C. diff. Those aren't causing the disease. Those are symptoms of a collapsed ecosystem. And so we rush in and we kill the weeds with more Roundup or more antibiotic or antifungals or anti-yeast effort, not realizing that the microbes are responding at the right level of damage. When you've wiped out the bacteria, the fungi have to respond in the form of mycelium or yeast or otherwise to start to rebuild the architecture of the damaged ecosystem so the bacteria can come back in. Once the bacteria are there, then the fungi actually step back and they, they're, they're gonna be out of the way because they, they've done their role. If you see candida, it's because the microbes aren't there. It's not because the candida is your problem. Candida is literally trying to rebuild the ecosystem. And so stop moving in with the antifungals. Instead, get that person in a biodiverse nutritional environment, biodiverse air environment where they're rebreathing a healthy microbiome, and you will see that symptom diminish. Absolutely. Let me just share with you kind of what we've done so far at the, in my work and where we're going. And I want you to pick it apart. Tell me where I'm, I'm doing it wrong. Because like, I feel like I'm super aligned with the vision that you see. And I feel like we've been doing it for six years. So, you know, for us, first and foremost, it was about sharing this new paradigm, right? And the functional forum, we made it free. We put it online. We've done 77 episodes, first Monday of every month. The second was creating communities of practitioners, right? Getting them together so they didn't feel like they were like weird, so that there were other people that thought like them so that they could, you know, share that. And we built practitioner communities everywhere. Then it was, how do we deliver that kind of care in like a in a scalable way so telemedicine and health coaches and group visits right and and helping people to do that then making it easy for doctors to sort of switch across to conventional medicine so that was sort of phase one and phase two which i think is is sort of underway right now was up until a few months ago was functional medicine group visits as a sort of a scalable way of delivering these principles to groups of people. And by the way, they can share all their own microbes in that community environment. Um, but now, you know, with Find Functional now looking to, you know, to, to make it easy for people to find these doctors and to like actually go after consumers now that the army is kind of built and the army is a little ragtag, right? There's a mixture of, <laughs> there's a mixture of thinking, you know, of, of uh, ways that people think, you know, you've got naturopathic doctors, you've got functional medicine doctors. There's, there's almost a common language that's been created, but there's also been kind of like you said, like a bastardization or when allopaths come across it for the first time, they're more comfortable with like, you know, with, with labs and supplements rather than labs and drugs. Um, but I think that the further you go into it, you really start to get into like, let's get real about, you know, what's going on in your life and what this means to you and why this has all come together. And I, I see some, some pieces in there. And so, yeah, like the next phase and, you know, for me, the last 10 years was all about trying to get doctors on board. And I feel like doctors are starting to come on board for all different reasons, but now like functional medicine has, um, data in the journal of the american medical association like who who knew that that was going to happen well now it has so more people are coming along but ultimately it does seem that this is a consumer revolution right this is people doing their health differently because ultimately eventually the consumer has to participate right the consumer has to do it anyway and uh so you know some of my efforts now are going towards like going to the actual people that have to change and you know facilitating new kind of combinations of, of community and, and building real community around around health, maybe around gardening, maybe around, you know, farming, maybe around sprouting, maybe around meditation. So that's kind of where we've been. And, and I would love to just get your, you know, input as to, you know, course correction for maximizing our impact in the next decade. I think you guys are on track. I, I, I think it has to be consumer uh, driven uh, shift or paradigm move because uh, science and medicine are too slow to change. 
you mentioned 17 years, but I think, you know, this is such a massive shift that we now need to make in our mindset that it could take us, you know, a hundred years or 2000 years to do that. If we're in the driver's seat, if we are not forced to change our modality, uh, we're going to be very slow to because our entire toolbox, our entire economic driving system for the way in which we get paid is all built around the two dimensional philosophy of human health. And so we're going to have to have consumers really driving the boat if we're going to you know, make this pivot fast enough. And the reason we have to do it fast is because we're going extinct. We, we have maybe eight years left to actually save the oceans. Uh, if we don't change our soil management in the next eight years, we're going to you know, tip over a very critical point of, of ocean acidification. We're already acidifying oceans and we're seeing the bleaching of coral reefs all around the world as symptoms of this. Yeah, and this gecko is crawling up my leg right now, which is awesome. Uh, and so uh, you've got this situation where uh, the infrastructure of biology within our soil and water systems are getting such that we are going to see radical extinction event happen. And when I was first working with farmers, it was amazing for me to hear that we, they were estimating that we had 60 to 70 years left to harvest crops on the earth. Soils that only had 60 or 70 years left. And I got goosebumps as soon as I heard that because we had already determined that biology. Every moment of like that, I think was maybe the first moment of the collapse of the planet, not vice versa. I may have froze up there on you a little froze bit. Up, but it's all right. It came back really super speedy at the end. So we got it very quick. Awesome. <laughs> And so that's, I think, the phenomenon that we can get excited about now is there is a revolution happening at the consumer level that you guys are a part of. And I think the way in which we can help consumers change faster is be very transparent about what we don't know. Um, we don't actually know the full capacity of viruses to improve adaptability and health yet. We don't know how how to work with a body that has spirochetes that needs its terrain fundamentally changed. We're just starting that journey of understanding. And so if you can be transparent with your patients in that journey, they will realize that they need to be part of the solution rather than waiting for you, for you to deliver some you know, patriarchal you know, uh, delivery uh, of the, the supplement they need or the pill they need or whatever. They need to be part of this journey back into nature and their lifestyle needs to reflect that. They need to see that their health is not uh, waiting for a functional medicine doctor to find a solution. They need to find out that health is coming from in their own bodies. And so in our clinic, we, we created the Intrinsic Health Series, teaching that there is no supplement that creates health. We can support health, we can support the garden, but ultimately we're waiting for your body to decide what is the priorities uh, for repair? What are the priorities of the real healing system? How are you going to really become that healing machine you're capable of being? And I, so I think it, the more vulnerable and the more transparent we are with our own you know, lack of knowledge, our own you know, humble state of awe of of mother nature and the systems that, that create us, uh, the faster we're going to be able to, uh, you know, support that change of the consumer mind. You can see how, you know, many of you probably experienced that you have this population of patients that have been moving with you towards this holistic mindedness and all this. And then the COVID fear machine propaganda turns on and suddenly they all drop 20 years of effort. And now they're just terrified of a virus. And, and they forgot the whole matrix that you've been teaching them for 10 years in a split second because CNN, because they, because they throw a pair of glasses on the anchor so that he looks professorial, he suddenly you know, is, is the, the, the magnate or we take a computer tech giant like Bill Gates and he can terrify the world that we're waiting for you know, some biologic solution here and he doesn't, he doesn't even know what a vaccine is. He's confused. He thinks we actually inject vaccines in the veins by his interview last week. So I, it's terrifying that this is the, 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 the way in which information is getting to our patients and it's even more terrifying that as physicians, we are prone to the same propaganda. We adopted the same fear par paradigm and didn't look at the early data coming in from China and everything else to ask, is there something other than a virus going on here? Uh, we should have asked that. We should have said, you know, is there just toxicity in the environment? You know, that's obviously what's going on. So, um, and in the end, we need to change our consumer mind. We are consumers of a healthcare industry uh, just as much as our patients are. And so, to help accelerate that consumer demand, I think if you guys can figure out you know, how to continue to parallel this, how do we as physicians encourage and enrich each other's experience so that we can see a, a bigger three-dimensional world of human health, and then 
simultaneously help the consumer come along that path. So it sounds like you guys are developing the right mix of consumer education, physician education and experience to really create that perfect storm of, of paradigm shift. Yeah, well, I, I I feel reinvigorated on on the mission after today because that you know there was there was things that were there at the beginning of like what we the, what I imagined like I'm really hearing kind of like the heart of the second episode where Larry Kolevsky was doing his thing and it was amazing and you know we had Dr. Kelly Brogan coming and shaking things up and it was really powerful and I think you know over time you get into the details of like what is it going to take for this primary care doc to change his mind and actually start a practice seeing people and we got very into it but i think with this new uh effort that we're building which is to go after consumers and have them integrate with the functional medicine ecosystem essentially getting the most people as well as possible for the least amount of money i think that some of the things that you've talked about there are essentially free getting your hands in the dirt and I, I totally agree with you about the, uh, the microbial stuff. For like five years, I basically said to people, like if people cough and they say, I don't want to touch you because I've got the sick, I was like, I'm not really a germ theory guy, you know, let's hug it out. And that always started people thinking in a different direction. And you're right, like that did shift in the last, uh, last little while and it's sad. So, Doc, thank Can you. Can I jump to a microcosm of, of our risk here, which is yeah. probiotics? So I, we've just spent the last hour talking about the importance of the microbiome and all of this. And what's on the tool shelf right now in, in all of these functional medicine offices are probiotics. And we've known for years that probiotics are, are missing the point. You know, three to five species will never equal 30,000 species of bacteria. Three to five species at billions of copies a day will never equal five million species of fungi. It's impossible. And so you cannot create a healthy gut with a probiotic. It's, it's literally impossible. And so their justification for it as an industry was, well, this slightly changes the microbiome as it goes through. There's a bit of a field effect, blah, 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 hand-waving, hand-waving, hand-waving. Uh, and I kept saying, you know, this is a real problem because we have no real endpoint science. We have short-term, one-week, two-week studies showing changes in inflammatory markers or things like that, but we don't have any evidence that there's any biologic purpose to three species uh, being planted every day in billions of copies because we're creating a monoculture in the gut over time. And they kept insisting, no, it doesn't actually set up shop in the gut. It just passes through. It doesn't actually. So that all got disproven in 2018. September 2018, there's two very important scientific articles for you to look up. If you just type in the journal Cell uh, Probiotic, September 2018, these both articles will pop up. Uh, one was done in mice, one was done in humans. And it showed exactly what my concerns were, which is, uh, not only were the three species actually setting up shop, uh, they actually were able to show it actually um, populating the, the mucosal surface of the gut lining and populating the luminar lumens uh, environment of the gut. And in both cases, limiting the recovery of, of microbial diversity. The studies showed an 80% drop in microbial diversity with two weeks of antibiotics, and then they randomized to placebo, uh, probiotic or fecal transplant that had been encapsulated before the antibiotic. Fecal transplant, they recovered in 20 days. If they took a probiotic, there was initial effort towards recovery in the first 24 to 36 hours, and you can see it kind of following the same line. And then with continued use of the probiotic, by day three, you start to see it suppressed. By day five, it is suppressed right back down to the same level of suppression that the antibiotic for two weeks had. And that probiotic now for six months in the human trial prevented recovery to, of the microbiome. And so in, it's extraordinary that we have so missed the, the appreciation of, of an intelligent nature and tried to again put it in a bottle. And so as we start thinking about microbiome diversity as a clinic, we were trying to find out how do microbes diversify? How do you go from a hospital setting of six dominant species to 30,000 species? And so we found that science in the soil science, not in the bio, human biology science. And it's these carbon molecules made by bacteria and fungi that set up redox signaling and have a carbon backbone that can bind critical amino acids and, and minerals for microbial diversification. So that's what we've been working with is soil compounds to rebuild the compost, if you will, of the human gut. And so now, and that's what we've been using for the last eight years, is an understanding of we cannot expect to be able to micromanage that gut microbiome back to health. We need to give the substrate, the, 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 the communication network and the compost, and then we need that patient to, to engage with nature. So we do that through food in the fermented world. And so I'm a huge fan of fermented foods like sauerkraut, sour reuben, uh, kimchi, misos, 
that's microbial intelligence coming in and diversity, hundreds of thousands of species instead of you know, three species. And, and same thing for their outdoor activities. Get them outdoors, get them breathing real air, get them out of their cubicle offices, get them you know, really living a, a natural lifestyle. And then that communication network can support that rapid recovery of the microbiome. And so this is an example of the, the cost savings. I think one of your main missions is to create a, an affordable healthcare system and plateau that, that ever increasing catastrophic rise in, in cost. There is a $47 billion probiotic industry now, $47 billion of an industry that simply needs to be replaced by nothing. That's a $47 billion saving right there. And so we can make medicine so much cheaper for our patients if we stop thinking of, of health as a micromanagement system. And so I really encourage you to look across your shelves of supplements and ask, is vitamin C at high dose really nature's way of developing? Probably not. We want, probably want vitamin C to come from fruits and vegetables. And we need this you know, biologic delivery system of fiber within the fruit or the vegetable to get those nutrients in, in, a, in a homogenous way in a biologically intelligent fashion. And hyperdosing vitamin C, you're right back in the kill mentality. Everybody, you know, everybody's really excited that we're treating COVID-19 patients with, with high, high dose IV vitamin C, and it's actually not very high dose. It's like 1.7 grams of IV every six hours or something. They're having benefit. Why? Because the IV vitamin C is reducing the amount of nosocomial infections in the hospital, not because it's fixing some viral illness or anything. It's just simply as an antibiotic type function, reducing the likelihood of subsequent infection. Um, but it's not changing the reason the patient showed up in, in the operating room. Again, we made the mistake that we're fighting nature here. Instead of thinking it as a nutrient delivery, nutrients that nature was trying to deliver, and let's make it a cheaper experience for our patients. Beautiful. Doc, I really appreciate all of your time today. I know we're running out of time. Thank you for our first conversation of many, I hope, and keep up the amazing work. And uh, I will uh, you know, share this with our community. I'm sure it'll bring up some great discussions and uh, hopefully accelerate the evolution of medicine, which we've always been about. So this has been Dr. Zach Bush. This has been the Rogue Health Economist podcast. We'll be back next week with another conversation. But Doc, thanks so much for being part of it. Keep up the amazing work and we'll be in touch very soon. Beautiful. Good work, James. Thanks to all of you. Appreciate the time.